Atlas. the sound. A thumbs up if the sound is good, please. Let's take a moment just to arrive at the big breath in, big breath in, let it go. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely the world offers itself to your imagination, 
told you like the wild geese first and exciting over and over announcing your place in the family of the No matter who you are, no matter who you love, no matter where you came from this morning, we're grateful to be here. I invite you to join us in saying together our congregational afternoon. Love is the spirit of the church. William Blake wrote To see the world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the fall of the hand, and eternity in this hour. Come, let us put it this way. Sonia lives with those she loves in the rainforest, where it is always green and full of life. And there we see Sonia and probably her mother in the rainforest, and there's a beautiful blue butterfly. Can you make a blue butterfly? Can you make a blue butterfly? Can you make a fly around in this way? Every morning, the rainforest falls to Sonia. And there we see her looking after her blue butterfly. Every morning, Sonia answers, and there we see the butterfly in the closer. In Sonia's rainforest, free and full of light, she visits old friends and meets a new one. Good morning, she says, one, two, three, four, five. Then there's a small She sang good morning, too. She stops to talk with some chatty new neighbors. Welcome, I work next door. No, I'm just saying, there she is with some bird. Very nice bird. Oh, very sneaky bird. 
He says hello to her most playful friend, and it will be her on my favorite to see what it is. The old blue butterfly floating along. If she's lucky, her fastest friend will invite her for a short ride through the thicket. We are mighty, Drummond said, for that is what she feels in her heart. And there she is riding on a Drummond with that. A jaguar. Sonia, the a colorful couple swim by. From dolphin, how broad is the case she has with this one? She congratulates the mamas with their new baby. I can't wait for you to meet my baby brother. I love him so much. <laughs> so many loves playing hide and seek five, six, seven, eight. Who she playing hide and seek with? Some friends help Sonia see things in new ways. Another baby. And Sonia knows who to visit when she just wants to be quiet and still. And there she is surrounded by these beautiful yellow butterflies. After visiting all of her friends, Sonia is ready to go home. She can't wait to see her mama and brother again. And there she is, the blue butterfly. But on her way home, Sonia comes across something she's not seen before. Right when she runs directly to the home. What happens to her? What do you think? Mama looks, Sonia said, and opens up her hands. Of course, we help. It's speaking to you, Sonia's mother said. And I will answer, said Sonia, as I always do. There's Sonia looking back at the ring for a new butterfly, and she said, We must all answer. We both do it as always. I just land into a space of meditation. That is what it is. You can just feel comfortable in your body. You can dry your clothes or you want to look down. When you're ready, let's take three breaths together and go by. I take the first two breaths in. Let it go. That was a big breath again. Let it go. And let it go. And I just invite you to take a moment to feel your feet and to feel your knees and to feel your hips and your spine, your shoulders and your fingertips, your face top of your head and to just breathe as is comfortable. Mary Oliver writes, the question is, what will it be like after the last day? Will I float into the sky or within the earth or a river remembering nothing? How desperate I would be if I couldn't remember the sun rising, rivers. You go watch it on the iPad. Here. I've got the video here. Not only have video and audio, it seems. Let's land back again. <laughs> It's the ideal moment. Let's take one more big breath in and let that go. And we'll just finish this with your eyes closed or just a soft gaze, whatever's comfortable. 
Late yesterday afternoon, in the heat, all the fragile blue flowers in bloom in the shrubs in the yard next door tumbled from the shrubs and lay wrinkled and faded on the grass. But this morning the shrubs were full of blue flowers again. There wasn't a single one on the grass. How, I wondered, did they roll or crawl back to the shrubs and then back up to the branches that fiercely wanting, as we all do, just a little more of life? How, I wondered, did they crawl or roll back to the shrubs and back up to the branches that fiercely wanting, as we all do, just a little more of life? Let's take a moment to just sit in the space of meditation together. And when you're ready, I invite your eyes to flutter open back to this space. Robert Frost writes, nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then the leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. This is the time in our service each week where we honor moments that are both gold and green and brown, moments that have lost touch, our joys and our sorrows. And I'd like to begin by offering an opportunity for anyone visiting for the first or second or third time who's feeling brave, who wants to wave and say hello so we can greet you. And I'll just ask that after we hear from each person, we'll respond by saying and moving, we hear you and we hold you and we care for you. Do we have any first, second, third time visitors? Yes. Did you just say your name? Is that okay? <laughs> Hi, this is about my third time. My name is Terry. Terry, thank you for being with us. We hear you. Hold you. Care about you. Hi, I'm, my name is Casey, um, and this is my first time here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, KC. We hear you, and we hold you, and we care for you. Thank you. What's the name? One, two, one. For our, our people who are shy to say their names, we still will say, <laughs> and we hold you, and we care for you. Do we have uh, birthdays or anniversaries we want to celebrate this week? Other joys or sorrows in the community. Yeah. My little three month old grandbaby got the awful RSV virus and it was always every day will we will they have my the parents have to take her in and into the hospital or something, but it was everything's much better. But this is for all the little babies having to get this awful thing and that they don't have a vaccine for it and of course the parents that it's such a worry so let's hope they can find something to help this for those little guys so for for healing for the gift of breath and for being in this life together we say we hear you and we hold you and we care for you mm -hmm. um. We lost uh, this week a very good family friend of my son and our family to pancreatic cancer. He was just uh, 41, and he leaves a very young child and a, and a wife and a wonderful family. So we have been um, sorrowing with them all of this week. Um, at the same time, my mother was absent a few weeks but she celebrated her 100th birthday in September and she's back. 
let's do those as two. So first for holding you all and the young ones and family in deep sorrow, we hear you and we hold you and we care for you. And in celebrating the joy of life, we say, we hear you and we hold you and we care for you. Thank you. Hi, this is Janet. And um, an amazing thing happened to me day before yesterday. I put things on marketplace to sell that I don't need. And I had put some Christmas stuff, including a 32 inch wreath and it was lighted. And so I put it on there for $25. And this person contacted me, Rebecca. And uh, well, somebody else asked, does it work? And I plugged it in and it didn't. So, so I, so I lowered it to $10. So Rebecca gets in touch with me. Turns out she lives very, very close to me. And she said she's just trying to, uh, uh, to provide a good Christmas for her kids. And so I thought, hmm, for her kids. Well, so just about that time, I go into my office. My mother, who died in 1998, communicates with me by the smell of roses. Now, I haven't heard from her in a long time. But I'm sitting there in my office and suddenly it was like somebody stuck rose bushes up my nose, Ro real strong, strong rose bushes. And I smelled everything else, all my candles, make sure I didn't have anything, you know, it's not in my mind. This is happening. Mom is talking to me. So what I got, I, knowing my mother, what she was trying to get me to do was help those people. Make sure those kids have a good Christmas, do whatever I can for them. So when she came over to get the wreath, I gave her the wreath and tree, uh, lighted trees to, to light her driveway and uh, head pieces for the kids and little Christmas trees that spell out joy and everything that I could find that I thought the kids would like to have. And, uh, and I gave it to her. And then when she came to get them, I asked her uh, if she lived in Loveland or if she just moved here, if she, you know, because she, she didn't have any, did she just move to Loveland or move in Loveland? And she told me she was in a domestic violence situation. And so uh, I asked her if she had gotten in touch with alternatives to violence. And she said, yes, she's working with them. She's in like a safe place around the corner from me. Um, but knowing what, I mean, I used to volunteer for them for one thing. And I was a, a I, I am a survivor of um, domestic violence. So uh, I told her, so I gave her everything and I said, well, you're right here. If there's anything, anything that I can do for you, please come to me and let me know. And so she hugged me. She's raising her three kids and her three, um, her brother's three kids. And she's just a little young thing. So she needs lots of help. So her name is Rebecca. Let's send out you know, good juju prayers if you pray, whatever you do, send it to Rebecca because she can use all she can get. So for hopes and for sorrows and for the magic of spirit in community, let's say. Mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Um, I've been gone for the past month, so it's delightful to be back. Um, I went out to Seattle and got to hang out with Rachel and Seth and our new grandson. So um, they're doing well, and I'm glad to be back. So for, for your return and for the, the joy of a new life in, in your life and our lives, we say we hear you and we hold you and we care for you. Hi, I'm Mickey. Um, I have two joys and a sorrow. They're kind of sandwiched. About a month ago, we traveled to Illinois and Iowa and saw uh, sisters of Vaughn, stayed with one of them, and saw my kid, two kids, and their grandkids. But about two days after we got there, the sorrow is that I got a call from the facility my mother was living in, 96 years old. Well, she's fallen and we're taking her to the hospital. So what do you do? So we had friends and family around here that could go and take care of her. Um, 
And so then after the hospital stay, we got back uh, the day that, or the day before she was um, uh, re released from hospital care and she went into rehab, which is, was a good thing. So that's a bit of a joy. Um, and I, you know, everybody said, well, it'll be two to three weeks in rehab, but after rehab, she has to go into assisted living which is something I'd been working on my, with my mother on, I shouldn't say on her mother. <laughs> she was really resistant. So I thought we had about uh, three weeks to arrange things. And does she stay in Denver or does she come up here? And so on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, which is a week earlier than I thought, we get a call saying, well, your mom's going to be released from rehab on Monday. So here's five days later. And I really didn't have anything lined up yet. So, so with the help of family and a couple of friends, and especially Vaughn, she was there every step of the way, we got her moved, um, cleared out her apartment, and she seems to be pretty comfortable. She's over at Brookdale, at Marianna Butte. And so that's my joy. And we are done with a month of joys and concerns <laughs> so for the for the month of joys and concerns but the lifetime of love that is holding your mother in this moment let's say we hear you and we hold you and we care for you Hi, I'm Kathy. Um, my good friend, Michelle, back in my hometown of Manitowoc, Wisconsin, passed away on Tuesday. She um, offered her home to, when my mother went into the nursing home and we sold my mom's home, we didn't have anywhere to stay when we went back there. And each of us had agreed we would go back twice a year for at least a week. And Michelle opened her house to us. She had two bedrooms that she'd created upstairs with a private bathroom. She made us coffee, she made us breakfast, she took care of us. We started calling it the Hartman Hotel. And all of us stayed there whenever we went back to see my mother. Well, this past, um, probably July, she was diagnosed with brain cancer. And so she went pretty fast all in all. But the good thing was that um, she has two lovely sisters, who the three of them were inseparable. And then a brother who was a Vietnam vet and was very troubled. And through this whole caretaking of Michelle, they all got themselves back together as a family. And it's a really, it's a really good thing that came of it. So for the, for the blessings of hospitality that live in this life and the next, and for holding each other in our, in our deepest moments, our opportunities for growth, we say, and we hold you and we care for you. On Zoom, Jennifer Klein writes, I have just returned from Perry for my 92-year-old mother after hip surgery. She is doing well, and I am readjusting to being back in the brisk way. Jennifer Klein. So for, for, for readjusting and, and for celebrating, again, the joy of life, we hear you, we hold you, and we care for you. I had I left a green fuzzy jacket here, uh, and I found one hanging over there, and I took it home. My wife pointed out that wasn't your jacket; that was somebody else's. So I put it back. And so, I, I, if anybody is missing a green fuzzy jacket, then there you are. I, I, I left it there. Secondly, uh, oh, I was gonna, these little plastic these little plastic things are not very exciting, but uh, they, they're great at holding everything from seeds and nails or whatever. I have a bag full of these, which I will give away if anybody wants them uh, during the break. And uh, I drink lunch, uh, you know. So I think it was all I was going to say, but uh, I think so. Yeah. So for oh. if anybody, I'm sorry, if anybody, I'm trying to clean out my house. My wife's suggestion and. Uh, so, well, not the whole house, but just my the the quote office that I have my stuff in. So, if anybody feels like have nothing better to do with their time and they want to volunteer to help me sort through it, I'll probably bring some of it up here to to give away, possibly sell, but also give away. But if you're interested in helping me do that, um, Christine Avio is going to help me, but she backs off. So, uh, if anybody's interested, it's not essential. I'm sure I can find other places. So, so. so for the the joy of upcycling, let's say. We hear you and we hold you 
and we care for you. And let's say one more for those that are deep in our hearts, for the joys and sorrows that we hold close inside, and for all those we don't yet know, let's say, let me hold you. Weeks ago, we remember hearing about this tragedy happening in Colorado Springs, where another queer space is rampaged by violence. And after the service, Reverend Dana and I were talking about it, and she said, I feel like I just didn't give it what it needed in the service. And I said, that would have been the whole service. And so we decided it would be great to have a service that really honors that moment. And that's what this is today. And I want to introduce this idea with this poem by Andrea Gibson, reflecting on another gay space being terrorized in the Pulse nightclub shooting. This is not the full poem, but this is a good section of it. Andrea writes, when the first responders entered the Pulse nightclub after the massacre in Orlando, they walked through the horrific scenes of bodies and they called out, if you're alive, raise your hands. I was sleeping in a hotel in the Midwest at the time, but I imagine that exact moment my hand twitched in my sleep. Some unconscious part of me knew that I had a pulse, that I was alive. The next day, I woke to the news that an assault rifle had fired 202 bullets in a gay bar in Latin night in one of the worst massacres in US history. The massacre of people who did not leave the dance floor when they heard gunshots because they thought they were the beats of a song. Everyone around me spent the day grieving and every tear tasted like someone's damp sweat drying in a morgue. People covered in their friends' blood, sobbing too hard to hide from their own deaths. People outside pushing bandanas into bullet wounds. It's true what they say about the gays being so fashionable. Their ghosts never go out of style. Even life, it's like funeral practice. 
Half of us are already dead to our families before we die. Half of us on our knees trying to crawl into the family photo. I kept remembering being 15 at Disneyland wearing my best friend's hoodie like it was my boyfriend's class ring. How many years it took me to touch her face. How many years I spent praying my heart could play dead to the threat that was gone to the world, changed till history was history, but history keeps coming for the high, shooting up bodies, kids drumming up reasons to have metal detectors at poetry readings in the poems. They're just unanswered calls to people who claim their God, their apathy is unwilling to accept change. Dear God, how broke do you have to be to not buy people time to get out the door when the song goes to hell? When this world drunk on hate decides blood is wine and drinks its fill in the only place they ever thought was safe and the only place they ever did not have to hide, the only place where they were wanted because of who they loved and how they loved and how they loved till somebody walked to their bodies and asked who is still alive and hardly anyone put their hands up. It just invites to take a breath in, and to let it go, and another breath holding that, and letting it go. And I just invite you during the offertory into a space of meditation, into a space of quiet, into a space of holding this tough poem, into a space of holding how hard this moment is in our world right now. For several years, when I lived in New York City, I joined my friend Lauren at Temple on Friday nights. The summer between undergrad and grad school, I led a theater program at the largest Jewish summer camp in the United States, 
And an unadvertised and unexpected part of that role was leading Shabbat services each Saturday morning for the entire camp of 2000. So by the time this goy got to New York, I was pretty familiar with contemporary Judaism. I could sing many of the songs and answer many of the prayers and responses in Hebrew. I was gifted a kippah, which made it with me on Friday nights to Romamu on the Upper West Side. Even though I was the only tall blonde in the sanctuary packed with hundreds of people, the poetry and the music and the rhythms helped relieve my self-consciousness. My individual me became consumed by the larger embodied we, and it was transcendent. It was sublime. Poetry, I learned in that space, is a communal practice. In an interview with Krista Tippett, Mary Oliver reflects on the nature of poetry, saying, it's also true that I believe poetry, it's a convivial and a kind of, it's very old, it's very sacred, it wishes for community. It's a community ritual, certainly, and that's why when you write a poem, when you write it for anybody and everybody, and you have to be ready to do that out of your single self, it's a giving, it's always, it's a gift. It's a gift to yourself, but it's a gift to anybody who has a hunger for it. My experiences with the people and practices of Romamu helped me to process the world through something beyond heady intellectualism that I got on Sunday mornings at All Souls UU Church on the Upper East Side. There's one poem, Psalm 121, which comes to my heart every time I hear news of another tragedy. Every time there's another desecration of sacred queer space or a school or a shopping center or a playground or a sanctuary, desecration has become part of our everyday and we all suffer because of it. We are all exiled from spaces of safety because of gun violence. Psalm 121 begins with two simple lines. I will lift my eyes to the mountains for where will my help come? The psalm presupposes a sense of exile common to the Jewish theological experience. Someone is searching for help. And that person turns to the mountains. They don't turn to a temple. They don't turn to the Ark of a Covenant. They don't turn to leaders or to priests. Instead, the psalm writer writes, I will lift my eyes to the mountains. The psalm goes on to imagine God arriving from the mountains, the resplendent beauty of those mountains being the only place grand enough to hold God in nature. And the first time we sang these words at Romamu, I was working through an incredible loss of my own. One of my students in Queens, a second grader, was killed by a garbage truck. And singing those words gave me a place to look as I searched for meaning. They gave me a sense of the grandiosity of the universe. The mountains seemed to be the only things big enough to understand how deeply my heart ached. By turning to the mountains, I was following an ancient Jewish tradition as well as a more contemporary search for meaning in nature exemplified by the Romantics. Romanticism in paintings and poems, art and language is rooted in a willingness to seek answers and inspiration in the natural world. Yet Romanticism is not naturalism. Instead, it takes the natural world and imbues it with rich meaning and possibility. It realizes the power of the sublime. The sublime is our willingness to reach into our perceptions of the world and to tip the scale toward grandeur. We've seen this throughout our slides this morning in paintings by American and European romantics. We've heard it in the words of romantic era poets such as Blake and Frost, and we can witness the echoes of this movement in the writings of Mary Oliver. Overweighting wonder and magic in our perception of the world as opposed to literal facts and images connects directly to outsized emotions of terror and grief. It is as if the immensity of our feelings must be matched by human renderings of the vast opulence of the world. As I've worked through stages of grief in response to the latest mass murder at Club Q in Colorado Springs, I have looked to the mountains. I've looked to art and to nature and poetry because they're a balm for my heart. The sublime has tended to my spirit. 
and yet I'm left wondering, from where will my help come? This question is very old. It's very sacred, and it's answered again and again in beloved community. While my eyes may be to the mountains, my hands must be stretched out, telling us that I am alive, reaching for more than this one wild precious life. If you're alive, raise your hands. Help will come from hands outstretched, hands that hold the sacred power of life in rooms and in countries that are full of death. Hands willing to do the hard work of making changes in our laws and our culture, and all of that must happen, but we are here right now, and we are grieving, and I say it is enough to just hold out your hand and say that you are alive. It is enough in this moment to cast your eyes to the mountains. It is enough to experience the world around us with heightened wonder, because these practices fill our hearts. They help us to press on through the box of darkness that we find ourselves in. In her poem, The Uses of Sorrow, Mary Oliver writes, in my sleep I dreamed this poem. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. Just as Andrea Gibson's hand raised in their sleep, realizing the darkness unleashed on the world, they woke the next morning and they created a powerful poem inviting the community into the devastation, into the sublimity of the moment, well beyond comprehension. Oliver's poem does the same, appearing in a dream as if too tender to realize in consciousness. These words remind us of the gifts of sorrow. Not today though, not when we're grieving, but in the tomorrow that our hands will build together. This is the promise of community and action that we find in liberal faith. We covenant to seek the truth and love, looking to the mountaintops, and to help one another with arms outstretched in the promise of action. May we be together in our grief. May all our tomorrows be shaped by the splendor of the world around us. May we find communion in poetry and art and in nature that holds magnificence. Although our eyes are on the horizon, our hands are reaching deeper into the present. May we find these gifts ourselves, and then may we give them to all who hunger. May it be so.
Mary Oliver writes, I don't want to live a small life. Open your eyes. Open your hands. I've just come from the berry fields, the sun kissing me with its golden mouths all the way. Open your hands. And the winged clouds following along, thinking perhaps I might feed them. But no, I carry these heart shapes only to you. Look how many small but sweet, and maybe the last gift I will bring to anyone in this world of hope and risk. So do look at me. Open your life. Open your hand. Let us open our hands and spread our arms wide, reaching into this day, into this world, into the sublime, stretching into life. Put your hands up to the world, harsh and exciting. We are alive. Let's land with a big breath and pull your hands up in the air with it. Pick it up and let it go.